uh, Disobey. Thank you very much for coming today. I'm going to start, jump right in and start with a story about Thomas DeVos. Um, Thomas DeVos was sentenced to two years in federal prison for hacking companies such as Yahoo and the Department of Defense. Roughly 15 years later, and Thomas is a free man hacking the same companies. But this time, rather than having to hide from these companies, Thomas is being paid to hack them. This remarkable concept that's getting more and more attention in recent years is what we refer to as a bug bounty program. Hackers are rewarded for reporting security issues directly to the vendor. The core concept, or at least the idea behind the bounties, is to encourage them to not exploit their issue and to report it directly to them and definitely not sell it on the black market. In this talk, how to get the best out of your bug bounty program and view from both sides, I'm going to be addressing the various aspects of the bug bounty industry. I'm going to look at the issues that one might encounter in their bug bounty journey and give you a basic overview of the program's perspective, the hunter's perspective, and how we can uh, work together and get the most of our program. Before I jump right in with the talk, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Edwin Fadil. I'm a computer science student at the ETH in Zurich. In my spare time, I like to do bug bounty hunting, a bit of security research, and I've got uh, experience triaging for various companies on various platforms. Uh, most people uh, will recognize me from this uh, picture of the Ed Overflow uh, alias online. So since we've got that out of the way, I'm going to start by defining two key terms. Now, for some people in the audience, this is going to look really weird. Why are you comparing a bug bounty program to a vulnerability disclosure program? But I just want to make this distinction, since from now on, I'm going to be referring to a bug bounty pro uh, program as one that pays hackers to, uh, to report their security issues, and a vulnerability disclosure program as the one that simply has an inbox or a security app email and accepts reports. And just to make sure that we're still all on the same page, I want to just define these two different types of programs, the public programs and private programs. Now, a public program is one that accepts reports from anybody outside in the world and has a security policy up online. A private, policy, a private program, on the other hand, requires invitations, so you have to gain reputation. A hacker would probably have to go and hack on public programs, build their reputation, and then get an invitation for a private program. OK, sweet. So now that we're sort of on the same page, we can start with the first issues. One in particular that we see all the time in the media, because this tends to be the main issue when it comes to disagreements, is the scope. And it usually boils down to a poorly designed scope. So when you're designing your security policy for a bug bounty program, you're going to want to be able to prove that you have liability over certain assets, and that you make it clear to the hacker what they're permitted to test and what they're not permitted to test. So to give you an example, let's, let's uh, look at these two, example.com. If you have that in your security policy and you say that is in scope, do you really mean all pages on example.com are in scope? If not, it's important that you state this particular page is not in scope. We don't want the hunter to go and test on this page. The reason for that is as soon as you start not making it clear, so as, as soon as you start saying what's in scope, you've got to sort of balance it out with what's out of scope too. And make that clear in, for, in formal written language in your policy. Another example of these, we see these all the time. Do you really mean all subdomains on example.com are in scope? And the opposite is true, too. If you don't have this in your policy, what if I find a subdomain on some company and I see the logo is there? Can I report it to your program? That's why it's really important that you're very clear when it comes to your scope. As an example, I've encountered this while hunting. As you'll see in the, in the, in the lowest bar, to me, as a hunter, the first impression that I get is that you haven't really put enough effort into your policy. Now, I doubt any hacker is going to go away and hack the whole web, uh, the internet and then report these issues to this program. But to me, it just indicates that they haven't really thought their policy through. And therefore, there's a chance that I might get into trouble. So here are two uh, solutions that I've, I've used whenever designing my personal scopes on programs. I suggest, one, that you, go, you design your scope, and you go to a teammate or colleague, and let them read it out to you. And then the way they, they interpret it, check how that compares to what you were trying to imply with your scope. If, if it doesn't, if it doesn't match what you had in, in mind, then probably you have to go back and redesign your scope. If not, then you probably got a well-designed scope. 
Another um, example, or at least solution that I've used, is to use security.txt files to design your scope. Now, for those who are not familiar with security.txt, a quick recap. It's a little txt file that you can place on your website. And you can see it as like a security uh, site map. It tells the uh, hacker how to report their security vulnerabilities to the vendor with a security address, with a PGP key, with their policy. And the point here being, in the latest spec, I made it clear that the txt file, the security.txt file, can only apply to the URI it's being retrieved from. So for a hacker, when they see this, and it points back to the program's policy, they know they can report any issues on that URI back to the program. In the first version of the draft, uh, I had an in-scope directive, as we see here on local Tapiola, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. I'm sure the team is here today, too. And it's, I think it's a great example. They're setting a fantastic example. But I removed that in-scope directive completely. And I only want the security.txt file to apply to the URI, so what you're seeing in the address bar above. On my next point with dedicated staff for a program, now, it's, it seems obvious that you need the, the right amount of people, you need the right capabilities in order to manage your program. But something that I've noticed that Google do in particular with their VRP, with their program, is that they take it in turns when it comes to triaging. So when they're receiving reports, it can often get, it's a lot of manual work and a lot of repetitive work. And it can, tire, it can become really tiring, and it can sort of you can burn out eventually. So what they do is they assign reports to individuals every week. So they take it in turns, essentially. So not only having the right amount of people, it's also important that you understand what they'll be capable of doing and that they don't burn out. Our next point, or at least something that's generally seen in the security industry, is having ways to inform third parties. Now, there are two ways I interpret this. One. If a security vulnerability is reported to you, you must be able to inform your customers and users about the actual issue. If they're affected, they need to be able to protect themselves. And one way that we do this is by publishing security advisories. You want to state the facts. You want to make it clear how you dealt with the issue, and then to explain to the user how they can protect themselves from this particular issue. One great example, I think some of you have seen it this week, was Franz Rosen, a famous bug bounty hunter, reported an issue that affects, well, to some degree, Let's Encrypt. It isn't actually an issue in Let's Encrypt itself. But the way the team responded is, by far, in my opinion, the best response I've ever seen. It's the way they handled the issue was extremely professional. They stated all the facts very clearly. They got to the point. There was no, oh, hiding the fact that, oh, we got this little issue. We're trying to downplay the severity. They were straight to the point. They explained where you can follow them to stay updated and how to protect yourself and how they were going to go about mitigating the issue. The second way I interpret the point of having to inform in third parties is sometimes when you have a program, somebody will report a security issue in software that doesn't actually belong to you. So you're not actually developing. It's not really in your personal code base. So you need to be able to have ways to inform the companies, or at least the vendors, that produce that software in order for them to patch the issues. I, pers I personally use this little shell script that I wrote. It's on my GitHub. It's contact.sh. And it quickly just skims um, reliable sources, such as HackerOne and so on, security.txt files, for addresses. And th that saves me so much time when I need to quickly inform somebody. It gives me a quick overview of how easy it's going to be to report an issue to that vendor. Next, res uh, next point, incident response. Now, in the security industry, this is, a pretty, this is a pretty known thing. But unfortunately, in the bug bounty industry, at least, from my personal experience, we lacked that a lot. We didn't tie our incident response process with our bug bounty program. So just because somebody has good intentions when they report the issue to you on a bug bounty program doesn't mean that some malicious hacker out there is exploiting, isn't exploiting the same vulnerability. We see duplicate and bug collision all the time. So it's very important that you tie your incident response team directly to the bug bounty uh, program, too, as we kind of saw with the Let's Encrypt team. That was basically an incident response to Franz Rosen's report. But on top of that, I have another little idea that I'm personally using, and that's earlier I said security.txt files only apply to websites. But in the latest spec, what I stated is that you can also place your security.txt files on internal file systems. And what that allows you to do is to put them on your internal network. And if a hacker or some white hat hacker gains access, unauthorized access to your internal systems, they can retrieve the security.txt file. And that security.txt file has a dedicated incident response address. So they can immediately contact the right people 
and trigger, possibly trigger incident response. On top of that, the cool idea behind this is they don't have to prove what they're capable of doing by causing any harm. They can just retrieve this harmless skew.txt file, and that's enough to prove what they're capable of doing. Service level agreement is something that's slowly been gaining more and more attention. I've noticed that more policies are including an SLA section. And that's, in the corporate world, this is a fairly known uh, thing that you use in agreements. But in the bug bounty industry, time is key, especially when you're trying to resolve an issue. You want to be able to communicate that and be as transparent as possible to the hacker. Therefore, I suggest that if you're going to write a policy, or if you're currently running a bug bounty program and you don't have an SLA, you're missing out on something including rough estimates of when you're going to respond to the report, when you're going to triage the report, and when you're going to reward the hacker, is going to motivate them to come back and report more issues. They have good expectations. They understand that you're a transparent company and willing to cooperate. Hence, the coordinated disclosure aspect of things. Finally, since we're talking about um, the uh, bug bounty programs and so on, we need to talk about bounties, of course. And I always get this question, hey, Ed, how do I determine the, uh, the bounty amount for my program? And this is a really difficult topic to, to discuss since there's nothing, there's nothing clear yet, as far as I can tell, that really, that really allows you to determine it as easily as possible. So I just, I just played around with some previous research done by Sky. And um, I found that one way that I personally like to do it is to tie the severity of the issue to the bounty amount. So that means you can't simply say a vulnerability type will pay this much. Cross-site scripting, $500. That just doesn't make sense to me, since cross-site scripting is going to have a different severity level based on the environmental factors. That's why we use severity metric systems such as CVSS, I'm sure some of you have heard of, to evaluate the severity of the issue in a numeric value. And using that, I, I realized that we could possibly just put a formula together and tie this CVSS number directly to a bounty amount. So you assign a maximum bounty. So let's say your maximum bounty is $10,000 for your program. And it will slowly create structure. And for each CVSS score, it will assign a value. Now, no worries. You don't have to uh, look at the math. If you find any issues, you can report them to me. It's all on edoverflow.com if you want more information about that. But what I'm trying to say is it creates a nice curve. It creates this. this this creates structure within your uh, bounty amounts. And on top of that, you can include this in your security policy. So to the hacker, they can go and verify whether you made a mistake. And that allows you to discuss things and really come to better conclusions and would probably reduce the friction within the uh, payment system when you're rewarding the uh, researcher. But since we're talking about bounties, the other thing that comes into mind is when do you reward a hacker? When do you and how much do you reward them, and how often do you reward them? And it reminded me of this tweet that I saw recently, and it's, a, it's an old article from The Guardian. And basically, the gist of the story is that uh, keepers at the aquarium were rewarding dolphins for bringing litter, so garbage back, out of the pool, and dead seagulls. But bit by bit, the dolphins were starting to catch on, and were breaking the, the garbage into little bits, and only bringing bits of the litter back to the keepers and getting fish for that. And then they were using those, uh, the fish to lure seagulls and to kill the seagulls and bringing them back to the keepers. Funny enough, to me, this reflects, actually, I've seen this to some degree in the bug bounty industry. To me, the dolphins are the hackers of the animal kingdom. In the bug bounty industry, if you don't reward hackers accordingly, they will start holding on to bugs, and they won't report them directly to you. And they'll wait until they can really escalate it, or they could possibly cause more harm. So it's important that we keep them motivated, so we pay based on the severity. But we also keep in mind that every now and then, possibly giving a bonus, not too much, don't want to make them greedy, but also encouraging them to come back with their issues is very important. I said that I, I, I have some experience triaging, and I, I know that it's tough work, and it can be really repetitive. Therefore, I wanted to come up with some possible solutions of how we can reduce the amount of work that your triaging team, your security analysts, have to do. Anybody that's hunting and has to report common issues, such as cross-site scripting and so on, will usually use a template, or at least they'll copy-paste their previous reports and just fill in the blanks. So Franz Rosen created this template generator that allows you to just Fill in details, and quickly it'll generate the report for you. Copy, paste, send in the report. 
I decided to use that for responding to security issues. So I have a bunch of templates for low quality reports or reports that we don't commonly accept. So I can just fill in the blanks and give them a fairly informative, friendly response to their reports. That also encourages them to come back. Another thing that we used to do on the HackerOne platform in particular was we had keyword triggers. They would trigger whenever a certain keyword was in the report and respond automatically. For instance, this one that we see on the screen right now was a little URL that everybody was using for email spoofing. And at the time, we didn't want that type of report. So we had a, a quick trigger that would just respond to that report, and we could move on. This saves us so much time so that we can focus on the more critical issues that really require in-depth analysis. Another thing that allows the triaging process to be a bit easier is to consider the hacker's reputation. Now, whenever I see a hacker on a platform, you can see their points. You can see that they've, 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 they've reported uh, vulnerabilities in the past successfully. Therefore, there's a, a high likelihood that they will be reporting another valid issue to you. As an example, if I see Tavis Ormandy reporting an issue to me and I close it and I, as I won't fix, I'm probably doing something wrong and I have to rethink my system. So it's good that you familiarize yourself not only with the hunter's reputation, but also with the community as a whole. So I refer to the bug bounty industry really as an industry, but there's a whole community behind it too. You'll see them on forums such as Bug Bounty Forum discussing various issues that they have encountered while hunting. And these are things that you can consider when running your program. That's why I highly recommend that people join these platforms, join Twitter conversations in the bug bounty community, and get some feedback from them. This will help you triage your reports much faster in general, because you will know who they are. And on top of that, you'll know what to expect from them, too. Another thing that I suggest bug bounty programs do is start hiring bug bounty hunters. Now, this isn't me crying for a job right now, but I highly suggest that in order to have somebody on the team that's really familiar with the whole industry is to hire somebody who's actually in the industry, currently hunting, who knows the other side and understands the people on the other side. When I joined Gratipay originally as a hunter, I noticed that they were lacking behind in, the t in their payout amounts. They thought they viewed the bug bounty payouts as tips. When I, de when I described the whole severity uh, connection to the bug bounties and the core idea, the core concept behind bug bounties, it's a, that's when we started raising the bar and receiving more valid reports and motivating hackers to help us out. Finally, I would like to, uh, rather than giving a whole summary and a recap of my, of my talk, I would just like to encourage people to also go and view bugbountyguide.com. It's a little, basically a book that I've written that allows you to see one side of the aspect and all the various issues that they might encounter in their journey, and then the same for the other side. So if you're a hunter and you want to get better, this is a good thing. But on top of that, it allows you to go and see the program's perspective. And vice versa, the program can now go and see what the hunter is expecting and what they're expected to do. I would like to end this talk on a, a, an open note. And I would like to encourage people here in the audience, if you're a hunter or not, if you're operating a program, or if you're planning on operating a program, is to consider all these issues and to come up with your own solutions and to share those within the community. Right now, this is a fast evolving, fairly recent, fairly new industry. And we need more people to come up with possible solutions and ideas that can help us further the industry and increase the positive responses. That's all for me. Thank you very much. I believe we have time for questions now. Is somebody there? Oh, microphone's on the way. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, so, do you think you should also consider the business impact in uh, for for paying out the bounties? Yes, or absolutely. Just like the technical nature. So when I talk about overall severity, I consider everything. So for me, the severity kind of means the business impact. 
That's interesting. That's actually an interesting question because in my personal security policy, you can go to hackerone.com slash ed, you'll see I actually define the terminology. I define risk, impact, and severity, and I make that clear so that there's no disagreement when evaluating the bounty amounts. But yes, I agree. That's definitely something that should be considered when evaluating the bounty amount. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, how about the complexity of the uh, bug? As in the complexity to exploit it, or the complexity? Yeah, uh, hold the chain if it's uh, really complicated, uh, many steps. Does it uh, you know, affect the bug amount? So in CVSS in particular, they do have factors like that. So for instance, whether the, the uh, bug requires user interaction and so on, those are all factors that are involved in CVSS. So if you evaluate the overall CVSS score with all three metrics, you should consider complexity too in there too. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Any more questions? No, I think we'll end on that. Thank you very much.